Hello, I'm Mosgen. And I'm Daniel, and welcome to Art Talks for Beginners. If you're wondering whether a painting is by Klimt or Claire, then you're in the right place. Welcome. Welcome. Daniel, in this episode, mm. we have a real tragedy. Oh, no. Are you ready? <laughs> you like making me cry. <laughs> I'm going to do it. One day oh, no. I will manage, I guess. <laughs> Off screen, I'm always crying when I look at these paintings. <laughs> Just trauma and trauma. <laughs> So shall I walk you through what I've seen? Yes. And you can tell me which tragic bits are which. <laughs> so <laughs> I see that we have a gentleman standing here with what looks like a harpoon or a staff or something. Uh, and there's like a cat slash angel. Feline. Yeah, feature. feline, exactly, jumping up on his chest. They're standing on a rock, it looks like. It looks like they're in some kind of mountains, maybe. I also see this the foot of a possibly a dead person and a hand, mm -hmm. starting to think zombies. <laughs> and then on the right hand side, I see also there's a little maybe it's a chalice or something on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. What else? What else do I see on the pedestal? There's a snake, maybe. Mm -hmm. Good. There. Get closer. Yeah. Oh, there's a crown mm -hmm. down here too. I see. Yeah. Okay. And what is on the left side? Yeah. That Let's is go. a plant. Is it figs? Yes. It's is a big it? tree. They always go for figs. It's a popular yes. one. And let's look at the creature a bit more. What maybe. is it made of? Made uh, of the creature. Um, I don't know. Looks like a lion, maybe. Yeah, it has a lion's body. And an angel's wings, or maybe wings birds. of an eagle. An eagle, okay. And tail of a serpent. Oh yeah, wow. It's not so visible maybe here, but it has to be a tail of a serpent. Okay. And the face and breasts of a woman. Right. And so a crown. And a crown. Mm. Yeah, it has jewelry on it, we see that. Yeah, but the, the guy is human. Yes, the guy is a human and he has a spear in his hand. Exactly. Okay, and thank you. as you have seen, they're, they're in the mountains. Yeah. Okay, you have, you have found all, all the symbols that we need to find. Okay, good. Now let's get to the story. Uh, this story is from Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. It's actually a Greek tragedy by Sophocles and it's called Oedipus. Ah. The story of Oedipus. You might have heard of him. Yes. He's quite famous in psychology yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, the story goes like this. Oedipus is born into the kingdom of Thebes. He is the son of King Laius. Mm -hmm. But King Laius uh, hears a prophecy about his son. That his son is going to kill him later on in life and is going to get married to his mother. His own mother. Yeah, and you can't get away from fate. In yeah, Greek exactly. Chinese. You know this very well that in <laughs> Greek mythology you can never overcome prophecy, so no. they come through. But Laius had to try, of course, to get rid of the baby. Mm. So he he orders Oedipus to be left in the mountains, of course, and one shepherd finds him mm -hmm. and takes him to Corinth with him, another yeah. Greek city. And eventually the king of Corinth gets Oedipus and uh, they raise him up, King of Corinth and the Queen of Corinth, uh, raises Oedipus up as if he is their own child. Okay, like adopted. Yes. Mm -hmm. But Oedipus doesn't know this, of course. Later on, when he becomes an adult, he goes to the Oracle in Delphi mm -hmm. and learns about the prophecy himself that he's going to kill his father and get, will get married to his own mother. But he thinks his father is somebody else. Exactly. Okay. He thinks that <laughs> his father is the king of Corinth. So he tries to escape from his faith. Mm. So he, he, he leaves Corinth and he takes a road to Thebes. Mm -hmm. And on the way, uh, he comes across with an old man and he has a quarrel on, on who's going to have the right of way. Something like that. And then he road accidentally road. kills this old man. Who happens to be his <laughs> original father, King Laius? Why is the king just out in the middle? Okay, I mean. <laughs> don't, don't get there now. It's a Greek tragedy. You don't question these things. It's why. all fate. Hmm. Um, then, following on the, on the way to Thebes, when he reaches the gate of the city, he finds Sphinx there, this creature ah. that, that we have seen. Sphinx is a mythological creature with the uh, body of a lion, uh, wings of an eagle and the face of a woman mm. and Sphinx had been terrorizing the city of Thebes basically killing people getting in and out of Thebes and not letting them uh, in the city or out of the city so basically 
feeding on them, more or less. We haunting can say, the city. Haunting yeah. the city, yes. Uh, besiege the city, we can say. Mm -hmm. And what Sphinx does is she asks a question, a riddle, to anybody who passes that way. And if you cannot answer the riddle correctly, Sphinx kills you. <laughs> and when Oedipus comes, comes forward, Sphinx, of course, gets in front of him and asks her question, her riddle. And this time, Oedipus uh, answers the riddle correctly. Oh. And when he does that, Sphinx is really astonished and kills herself by throwing herself in the sea and so, is killed. So much drama in this story. Yeah. <laughs> and by doing this, Oedipus wins the freedom of the city of Thebes. Okay. And because of this, the, the city of Thebes uh, accept them as their new king. And uh, since their own king is killed, King Laius is killed on the way, you know. His father, but he doesn't know that. Yes, uh, he doesn't know that. They offer him the hand of uh, the queen of Thebes, which is his own mother, right. Jocasta. So he gets married to his own mother. He doesn't know, she doesn't know. Despite the age difference. No, no despite <laughs> the age difference, because he's a hero. He won the freedom for the city. Mm. And Jocasta cannot say anything either. And eventually they learn the whole truth after so many years when they had four children. Oh, wow. And in the end, Jocasta kills herself, Oedipus blinds himself. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's a very tragic story. Mm. And what we see here in this painting is the moment when Sphinx comes across with Oedipus. The riddle. Yes, okay. and the riddle mm. part. Okay. After learning the details of the story, I believe now, now you can look at the painting again, read it with a different eye, Daniel. Yeah, I think so. So when you're telling the story about the travel of Oedipus from, from to Thebes. From Corinth to the yeah. Thebes. Yeah, you said that he got into a quarrel with what turned out to be, or would turn out to be his father later. Uh -huh. I see at the bottom of the painting there's a, a foot and a hand and a crown. Uh -huh. That must be the murdered king. Um, not specifically. No? I believe these, these are actually narrative details mm. to tell you that Sphinx actually has killed so many other people uh -huh. okay. who have come across uh, on the way to Thebes. Right. And they, they can be kings, they can be travelers, they can be shepherds, they can be different types of people. The crown is there to, to re represent that. Okay. Uh -huh. These are all body parts of people who have been killed by Sphinx. Okay, but this is, is this the entrance to Thebes? To Thebes, okay. yes. Actually, if you get a very closer look in between the mountains, you can see the city shining uh -huh, okay. at the very distant yeah. back. You that. can see that Thebes is there, so this is the narrow passage right. to the city. If you do not pass through that, you cannot reach the city. That's why Sphinx controls it very well, okay. that we understand. So uh, this is the moment you said, if we know that this is the Sphinx uh -huh. asking the riddle, or maybe this is just after the moment when Oedipus has answered, perhaps, because they're looking at each other so intensely, I guess. Yes. I believe this is the point where uh, Sphinx is about to ask the riddle, or just has asked the riddle, uh -huh, okay. and Oedipus knows that he cannot, he cannot falter, he has to answer correctly, otherwise he's going to be killed. This okay. is the exact moment, right before the, the riddle, or right after the riddle, that's okay. the moment. Did, how did he know the answer? Yes, he know. found it. <laughs> he's a clever guy. Yes, Oedipus. Okay. and it's his fate. Don't forget oh, yeah, that. That's true, yeah. Also. <laughs> so what else do we see around here then? The, what's the significance of the fig tree? Fig tree is actually a symbol of sin. You mm. might remember that fig tree was the original tree in the original sin where right. Adam and Eve got, got the fruit. So yeah. this is a representation of original sin, the sin of the woman. Right. And this is actually connected more with, with Sphinx. Mm -hmm. Sphinx is a woman. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's connected with the sin. I have to tell you that this is a symbolist painting. Okay. This time we're not going to do any movement analysis because this is a <laughs> tough one. This is a symbolist movement mm -hmm. from the end of 19th century. Okay. And symbolist movement uh, followers, they believe that uh, women are uh, seductive mm -hmm. and they are prone to sin and they are insatiable. Mm. So they are sinful creatures, they tempt men into, into committing sin. Mm -hmm. And Sphinx is the ultimate representation of this in this yeah. story. Mm -hmm. This is what we call a femme fatale. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. in, in, in French. It's the, the fatal female, the deadly woman. The spear? Is the spear important for something you didn't mention a spear? It is, it is important in this sense to, to show the tension between Oedipus mm -hmm. and the Sphinx because mm -hmm. uh, you see Oedipus, Oedipus is hanging on to his javelin, his spear, because he knows that the moment he answers uh, the question wrong, Sphinx uh -huh. is going to put the claws on him yeah. and kill him instantly. Mm. So this is her his defense mechanism. She's pretty close to doing that already. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that is what creates the tension in this story. Yeah. Sphinx is on him, touching him directly. Mm. The claws are on, on his chest mm -hmm. and the rear leg is on, on his genitals, mm -hmm. on his crotch. So she can instantly destroy him no when you see the power. <laughs> get, no, you have a question. <laughs> get the question right, but uh, you anyway, get it wrong. Uh -oh. <laughs> so that that is also to show you the the tension. And when you look at look closely at the gaze, mm. you see it's very intense. Yeah. As if Sphinx has opened her eyes, as if she's about to hypnotize him. Mm. It looks like they might be in love. A little bit of the or you may think like this. Yeah. This case is also explained as it's a battle between evil and, and good, mm -hmm. but it's also a battle between sexes, mm -hmm. female versus male. Right. And you see the sexual ten tension simmering in mm -hmm. this in this case. That's why it's important. How about the chalice over here with the Yes, that one is also another subtle symbol. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one looks like a chalice, it has a, a, a leg, but on top it's more or less like an urn mm -hmm. to keep the ashes. So it is a symbol of death. Uh -huh, okay. And supporting the symbol of death, you have noticed the snake. Right. The snake is also a symbol of death, also is a symbol of sin. So the connection through Femme Fatale and mm -hmm. all the fig tree and the snake to the original sin are all here okay. in a very, very subtle way. And on top of the urn, if you get a little bit closer, you will see there is a small, tiny butterfly on oh, the yeah. very right corner. Mm -hmm. And butterfly is the symbol for hope. Uh -huh. So in, in the, on the right hand side, the painter is trying to show us this is a moment of death and life. And mm -hmm. you can either die or survive. There's still hope if you answer the riddle <laughs> correctly. You hope you get it right <laughs> so that you can get, catch the butterfly and be released from the thing. Yes. The story of Oedipus has been a very popular topic in, in art. So we have a lot of examples from different painters painted on this story. Mm -hmm. So I have chosen two more examples for you, Daniel. So you, you will now see them and compare them with what we have okay. reviewed so far. Yeah. Let's start with the first one. This one? So if we compare the way that they're standing, they're not touching each other, which yes. is the first thing you notice. Exactly. In the original one that we were looking at, the Sphinx is yeah, ready to attack, claws are almost out. Um, and in this one, I see that there's more of it, it looks like a conversation. So this looks maybe a little bit later, maybe when he's thinking about the riddle and giving an answer, perhaps. Yes, um, yes. This and is the first do one. you think it, it has the same amount of tension that we have seen in the painting we have? Mm, I guess this in the original one, the first one that we looked at, there's the, the physical tension there yes. immediately, and that, that sort of heightens the drama, the picture of the image. But here, I think there's still drama, it's just less. Yes. It's more like there's a tense less moment drama. still. Mm. Yeah, there's still some tension, but this, this painting, it's from a French painter, Fab, and this one is earlier than the one we had. Mm -hmm. And this one tells you more narrative part of the story. It tells you the full story because it gives you more landscape and puts the figures in equal weight mm -hmm. and shows you what that Oedipus is actually explaining the answer to Sphinx or maybe they're having a conversation just before the riddle. So you mm -hmm. feel like you're more in the story in this one. It has more narrative qualities. Okay. Let's look at the other one. The figure of Oedipus is much closer. It's mm -hmm. very geometric. Like a sort of, you know, what shape is that? Like a T, maybe. Mm -hmm. Very geometric arrangement. It's yeah. a nude figure study, mm -hmm. more or less. They're, they're close, but they're not touching. Mm -hmm. like in the Again, one. there's there's this distance in between. Right, um, but there's still that sort of that, yeah. This this gesture looks like maybe uh, offering a, uh, an answer. To yes, riddle. explaining. This is the gesture of explaining with the hand. Right. And when you look at Oedipus, in this one, you can see that Oedipus takes the main stage here. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's the biggest figure. Mm -hmm. And Sphinx, on the other hand, is, is a little bit in the shadows. Right. 
is hit a bit more passive, uh, more in the darkness. So oh. she doesn't dominate yeah. the picture. So maybe the artist the... is not very good at drawing cats. <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't want to bring bring forward the mythological <laughs> couldn't, couldn't creation. Quite get it right, so just <laughs> hide it. Yeah. So but there's it is a really good study of the of the anatomy. I yes. know that's... Because the painter, what the painter tries to do on this one is to bring forward a male nude study and. Mm bring forward the naked male figure mm -hmm. and to show his talent on painting that, mm -hmm. not focusing more on, on the Sphinx side of the story. Yeah. But when we go back to the original, we see that everything on this painting is about the tension we have in mm -hmm. the middle by touching each other, looking intensely at each other. The spear. And yeah, the, the spear. Exactly. All these details are giving you the tension, but not much about the narrative. Mm -hmm. The narrative part is only the dead body parts that we see at the bottom. Otherwise, there is not much narrative detail mm. here. This painting is doing something else that the others haven't been doing. Mm. Uh, this painting is symbolist, as we have explained in the beginning, and it is trying to create a different type of history painting, because normally in history painting, in the French academic style, mm -hmm. you need to have some narrative details. Okay. to show the weaver what the story is about. Mm -hmm. But here on this one, the painter instead uses very subtle symbols. That's mm -hmm. why we call it symbolism. Mm -hmm. And these symbols were actually not supposed to be in this painting. Mm -hmm. uh, normally when we look at symbols, for example, when we talk about iconography in Christian art, there are certain symbols you need to use to address Holy Spirit. For example, you need to use a white dove, to represent mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Right. This is what we call iconography. But mm -hmm. in symbolism, the painters do not use those iconographic symbols. Instead, they use other symbols, mostly associated with femme fatale, mm -hmm. death, dreams. These are the topics that the symbolists mm -hmm. really love. And put things here and there to, to associate concepts in the painting with right. those things in a very, very subtle way, not in a very direct way. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of symbolism. I like this kind of subtle, yeah. Playing yeah. With this That's why you need to, you need to, as a as a weaver, you need to really focus on these things and connect right. with the painting, and you can interpret things by yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not already read the reading it's given not, to you. Yeah, on the plate for you. Yeah. Exactly. So if I want to go and see this painting, where do I have to travel? The painting is in New York today. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Okay, and is it? It looks quite tall. How? Is it uh, one of those small ones? No, <laughs> this is not a small painting. It's actually roughly one to two meters. So it's it's quite a life size. Uh -huh. Two meters tall and one meter wide. Yes. Okay. So it's it's a big painting. It looks maybe life size then. Almost. Yeah? Okay. Almost. It's a it's a big painting. Good. And this one is from eighteen sixty four. Uh -huh. yeah. Towards the second part, towards the end of nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. And symbolist it, style. Yes, it? it's symbolist. symbolist but it okay. is actually the earlier pieces of symbolism because Moreau has been accepted as the founder of the symbolist mm -hmm. movement, has been the main inspiration of the symbolist painters who are going to come after him. They have always turned back and uh, looked at Moreau's paintings and got inspired by his paintings. So we today accept Moreau as the founder of that movement. So these are early examples of symbolism. If it's symbolism, I know that the French Academy was very important in the 1800s, I guess. Was this accepted or was it one of those? It was. It oh, was. Okay. Sometimes you may never know <laughs> how the French Academy will react. <laughs> right. So they, they exhibited this, they accepted it, and they actually loved it. It uh -huh. became a really big success and opened this way for, for Moreau to be accepted as this guy who brings in interesting symbols mm -hmm. to art and creates a new perspective. Okay. One thing I didn't ask you about was the riddle. Oh yeah, we didn't Do you know the riddle? Me. Yes, okay. I know. Do you want me to ask you? Not really, but let's see if I can get into Thebes or if you're going to kill me. Ah, we'll see, <laughs> let's try. So the riddle was, yeah. what walks on four feet in the morning, uh -huh. on two in the afternoon, okay. and on three at night? Four in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three, three at, night. at night. Sounds familiar, but I don't. I don't know what the answer is. I think I might have heard it before. But <laughs> give me a hand if you can write in the comments, see what you think it is. But don't Google it. Yeah. You can Google it once you've written the comment. <laughs> yeah, I'll let's see same. your answers. <laughs> That's all for today on Moros painting Oedipus and the Sphinx.
Thank you very much for watching us. Stick around for questions more stressful than any exam you've ever taken. <laughs> and stay tuned for Art Talks for Beginners. Goodbye. Thank you.